Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Fortunately for us, Kate Wood believes that buildings and neighborhoods with historic significance are what helps to make this city the wondrous place it is. And believe me, she works hard and tirelessly to protect them. So welcome, Kate. Thank you, Ronnie. The, the preservation movement is a stronger movement every day, isn't it? it seems to me. Well, preservation has gotten much more mainstream. It used to be back in the early part of the 20th century, even going back to the 19th yeah. century, there were always civic movements. And preservation really grew out of that social movement and became much more of a mainstream movement in the 20th century. A lot of people think that preservation started with the demolition of Penn Station in 1963, right. but it really started a lot sooner than that. Was, I, I read someplace Mount Vernon. George oh, Washington's yeah. Mount Vernon. You go when back was to you go back to the 1850s with right. that, with you know volunteers just yeah. coming together and so uh, finding terrible. ways to raise money to save things like Mount Vernon that we take for granted today. It's the home of George Washington, yeah. and of course we're going to preserve it as as a landmark and a museum. But it wasn't always it wasn't that, always so certain that that's it, what would happen. Exactly, exactly. And the, the Penn Station thing is most likely what hit the consciousness of of the public, the general public. I think right? it's the thing that... I don't even know how that happened. How did well, they take that down? You know, it's interesting because at the time the demolition, that that Penn Station yeah. was demolished, it was really only right at the cusp of being about 50 years old, yeah. which we think so, now, you know, think of the buildings that are 50 right. years old they, now. Yeah. I mean, to Columbus Circle, for example, or uh, a right. lot of the modern buildings of the mid 20th right. century are just now at that same age. So it's it's really when buildings are at They're their post, most. I mean, post war is 50 it, years old. Exactly. It's when buildings are at their most vulnerable because we yeah. remember them as being part of our own That's time and we don't really think of them as being landmarks. Right. But it was so beautiful. I remember playing there. I used to go with a friend and we'd go sightseeing around. Well, it's impossible to think that 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 the city so could have incredible. let a building like yeah. that go. But it was it was prior to the creation of New York City's. Landmarks Law, which was 1965. So at that time, really, the city had no tools for preserving buildings unless the owner wanted to preserve so them. It seems to me, if you look on the internet and you look at preservation, m many, many, many cities have their own preservation landmarks uh, commissions and thousands, committees. Thousands, thousands. And they're also worldwide preservation movements and organizations. Well, yeah, I mean, there's the, the World Monuments Fund right. or groups that really operate on a global scale, and then you go down to the nationwide groups, yeah. the National Trust for Historic Preservation, mm -hmm. which represents hundreds of thousands of members throughout the country, and uh, all the way down to citywide groups and neighborhood groups like mine. Now, your, your neighborhood group is Landmark West. Landmark West. And it's how old? We've been around for 21 years. 21 years. Yeah, founded by Arlene Simon, right. who's a, a longtime Upper West Sider, and uh, I've been with the group for about five years now. And it goes from where to where? It goes from 59th Street up to 110th Street between Riverside Park and Central Park. So really that whole swath of of uh, the Upper West Side that we think of with uh, Central Park West and right. brownstone blocks right. and all of that. Those are come under it. Let's yeah. just go back for a minute. There's federal legislation, isn't there, for landmarking? There is a National Historic Preservation Act, which was actually passed right after uh, New York City's City, landmarks was law. Was New York but City one of the first to do that? Uh, New York City was the first is that right? landmarks law, and it's still considered one of the strongest laws in the country. Right. And did that come out of the Municipal Arts Society and other people? or well, There was a whole was movement. The there was it, it, it was a progression was through the decades. Actually, there's a history of that being mm. written right okay. now, and so I think we'll all learn more right. about it. Uh, you know, there people who are still very active in preservation today were involved in, in getting the law passed in the first place. So it's now a very acceptable thing. It's not that you look at people who want to preserve something and say, oh, you're really, I mean, it's a- Really it's a, radical. Right. It's a tenant, <laughs> isn't it, of, of livable, or livable urban society? Basically, the mix between old and new and the preserving of the old. I think most people, especially people who live in New York, um, have right. an intuitive sense of, yeah. of historic buildings and why they're important and how they sort of shape their daily lives. You walk down Broadway or you walk down a side street of the Upper West Side and, and look at the brownstones, and you can't help but 
but appreciate the fact that this is what makes the West Side the West Side, or this is what makes Harlem Harlem, or Brooklyn Heights Brooklyn Heights. So buildings play a really important role in that. Um, a lot of times people don't really think about how important buildings are until mm -hmm. they're just about to be lost and you have these sort of 11th hour efforts to save buildings that are eminently threatened with demolition or are falling apart and that's too bad. I mean what what groups like Landmark West are really trying to do is make preservation a part of planning process. so that, yeah. that that we're proactively working to preserve these buildings before it's too late. Instead of having to run after everybody. Exactly. And it's especially acute I guess as the population shifts and new development and new neighborhoods get created so often at the expense of the old neighborhoods. Well you've seen just on the west side about the, right. the population, the demographics have shifted, um, block associations and neighborhood groups which were once so strong and yeah. the west side being so politically activist. Yeah. Things have, have shifted and changed and uh, Landmark West has been around for a couple of decades thing. now. We plan to be around for a little while longer. Oh, and, that's good. <laughs> and so we're trying to kind of keep the spirit alive. You know, it's so interesting because, I mean, we love to go to Paris and Rome and other and quaint towns and Italy and, I mean, just or any place foreign because we love the old buildings and the low buildings and all of that. And right. yet we don't really associate that charm and that attraction with preserving buildings here. Well, it's New York has, as I said, a very strong yeah. landmarks law. It's a question, how does the law get used? Which buildings well, are Let's talk are a little bit about the law. The, the, I mean, we've always, I, there's a whole lack of connection, it seems to me, when you were talking about development, mm -hmm. between development and planning, and you're saying landmarks, I say taxes mm -hmm. and, and financing. Uh, it's not all holistically together. I mean, it's not, you don't have that process. The Euler process, which is an attempt to do that, mm -hmm. I guess, eliminate, doesn't, it, what does it, how does the Euler process, the Uniform Land Use <laughs> Review Plan, how does that affect historic landmarks? Well, historic, uh, I mean, that's the plan the city has to ensure public participation. Right, in and getting, ma making sure that the public has an opportunity yeah. for input right. into the process when it comes to development that doesn't meet these sort of as of right standards right. for development, the zoning. So how, do, so how do landmarks fit into the Euler process? Well, the Euler process does have a section on historic resources and the impacts of any development on historic resources has to be uh, evaluated. Um, there's also, if the building is a landmark, the Landmarks Commission has to review how any changes would impact that building or that context if it's a historic district. So, but, but landmarks and, and ULERP are separate processes and they're not always wed together as well as they should so be. So, a building can go to the Landmarks Commission. How does that get to, let's talk about that first. Let's take the planning process and set it aside. Right. There's a Landmarks Commission. Right. It's appointed by the mayor. All, of, all 11 of the Landmarks Commissioners are appointed by the mayor. They're not voted or elected, they're appointed by the mayor. And do they have to be confirmed by the City Council? They have to be confirmed by the City Council. Only one of them is paid, actually. They're all volunteers except for the chair. That's and he's the only full-time paid commissioner. The, the rest of them are doing it on the side, so to speak. And there's a department. They have how many they employees? They have uh, about... F uh, it ranges 50, 55, not nearly as many as they need to oversee you know, the 23,000 or so landmarked buildings in the in the city. Is that how many there are? That, that's, that's about how many there so are. So the west side has over 10 percent of those landmarks? The west side, let's see, I'm not so good at my, yeah. <laughs> my, my percentages, right. but but the west side has about 2,600 yeah, designated so landmarks. That, so it's almost, it's more than 10 percent. Or 1 percent, I guess. 1 percent. Yeah, we'll have, to, we'll, have to, we'll have to work that out. We'll figure it out. You figure, the viewer should figure that <laughs> okay. out. All right, now, um, when we get back to the landmark procedure, how does a building get to the Landmark Commission? It's, it's sort of an interesting process, and I can't say that I can answer it, um, because the Landmarks Commission has what they call the Request for Evaluation, which is a form you can download off their website, and uh, fill it out, say, this is the address, the name of the building, this is the history and significance of the building that, uh, that you know, I or you are aware of. Anyone can fill out one of these forms. What happens after that is a little murky. It 
get submitted to the Landmarks Commission and it just sort of stays there. And the Landmarks Commission might write back a letter and say, uh, thank you very much for your interest in preservation. They might say, we'll take this into consideration. They might say nothing. So uh, there's no clear path. And that's one of the things that we were so concerned about with Two Columbus Circle, which I mentioned earlier in 1964. Let's talk building. about Two Columbus Circle. It's that the, what they call the lollipop building on right. the south well, end of Columbus Well, not anymore, Circle. unfortunately. The, the lollipops are gone, gone huh? yeah. And it was done, well, tell us about the building. Well, it was uh, built in 1964. It was designed by Edward Earl Stone, who was an internationally renowned American modern architect uh, working in um, 1930s, 40s, 50s, through the 70s when he died. Um, it was built as a art museum uh, for Huntington Hartford, who was a uh, an eccentric exactly, <laughs> <laughs> who had who had sort of a, an amazing eclectic art collection, which he wanted to have his own building to house, and he hired the architect Edward Drell Stone, who who designed MoMA, to um, to design his building for him right at the base of Columbus Circle, and it was Stone, it's been talked about ever Stone since. Stone designed. The original moment. He did. He did. Oh, he did. Very that. different style, but yeah. but also quintessential Edward Durrell mm -hmm. Stone. So he had it. So he had it. It it operated as a as an art gallery for about ten years, and then it went through a series of of changes. And uh, the last tenant was actually the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the Tourist Bureau. It got all involved in a trans in a gift, I think it was, wasn't right. it? Right. Well, and Huntington Hartford, when he could no longer use it as a museum, he he it transferred to a foundation, and then the foundation gave it as a gift to the city. So it was given to the people of New York City to use forever as a cultural uh, center, and. Um, uh, through the the years, the that sort of restriction that was placed in the deed got transferred around to different owners, and it ended up in the hands of the Economic Development Corporation, which is the development arm of the city. So what happened with that is in the late 90s, when the Giuliani administration decided that it wanted to do something different with Two Columbus Circle, aka get rid of it. Um, they they uh, used that um, that uh, right that they had to to, uh, to 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 send it on its way. But it got transferred out of the city government for a while, didn't it? And then it came back in. It was a very murky kind of thing. I was in the council at that yeah. time. But I don't totally remember. It seems to me that Viacom or Paramount, when they built the um, Gulf and Western building, somehow right, exactly. Viacom ended up with the. Um, reverter rights yeah. on the property. It, it, it is very murky, but basically the, the decision about what to do with the building landed in the lap of the Economic Development Corporation. Right. And that's where the problem started, because basically the administration decided that they wanted to redevelop the site well, and not It was important it. because they were able to circumvent any kind of land use rules by having public hearings or doing anything. Exactly. So it just went that way. So then the they, Landmarks Commission decided that they weren't going to have a hearing about the building yeah. because if they were to designate a building, they'd have to have a public hearing first. So that process was shut down. The ULERT process was shut down. and. To Columbus Circle ended up in the hands of a museum that had absolutely no interest in preserving it. At one point, it, it looked as if it was going to land up in the hands of Donald Trump. Right, right. And then it was, you know, it, I mean, they had put out an RFP. There were several RFPs, and right. that was always questionable, too, as to there was a Dahesh museum who wanted to have it as a museum. Right, well, the, Deh the Deh 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 Dahesh, Dahesh. Dahesh, however okay. you pronounce it. Um, wanted to restore it yeah. and use it the way yeah. the Guggenheim uses their Frank Lloyd Wright building or the Whitney uses their Marcel Breuer building. Um, so unfortunately, whether it's Trump or the Museum of Arts and Design or whoever it is, they had only in their heads that they wanted to, to design so, something different. So it's now being uh, reconfigured. I mean, it's the facade is gone. It's going to be glass, I think. And it's going to be, it's no, no bigger. It's going to be the same size. It'll be the same size, same footprint. But it's, it's not a difficult the building. Site, yeah. But it became, it mobilized many, many advocates, right, for preservation. Right. From modern ones to historic ones. Well, it's interesting it? because we're still kind of living with that legacy. And, and uh, a lot of people got involved in preservation who hadn't been involved before mm. because they saw something that they valued for a lot of reasons. That, you know, the building at Two Columbus Circle 
Some people thought it was beautiful, some people thought it was horrendous, but I think every, the, the issue that resonated with everyone was, was the process. What happened to the process? How come this building, which there's so much debate about, it was listed on every endangered building list you can imagine, um, so much support, the New York Times editorial, I mean, all this, this, right. this discussion, and it couldn't even get a public hearing. So what happened to the process? So that's what's now the, the question that preservationists in the city are, are really discussing and planning. And I mean, so well, how do we, how show do we... us something else. I mean, is there no other way other than just send, filling out a form and saying this is the building you want? That's the process as it is now. And it's a beautiful process if you can rely on a Landmarks Commission that's to willing it. to, to But are to you suggesting it? that they have a hearing on every application that comes in? There are a number of proposals on the table right now. Mm -hmm. um, there are some bills that have been introduced at City Council. There are bills that may be introduced at City Council. But they're all dealing with this issue of transparency. How do you get the Landmarks Commission to to show you its process and respond when they receive this kind of request, just to make sure that it's not being um, it's not being suppressed somehow. And people think that this is only a Manhattan issue, but it's not at all. Is Preservation? It? Yes. Not at all. I mean, we find yeah. that that some of the biggest supporters of landmarks preservation, neighborhood community preservation, are in the boroughs. Uh, Queens has a very active preservation community. Mm -hmm. um, elected officials are much more tuned in than to, they have been in the past. Right. Um, it's, it's definitely a citywide grassroots issue. So does there need to be a charter change? It seems to me, since it is reflective of, of every neighborhood in a city, that, that the borough, I mean, we could follow the way we do the plan. I mean, the planning, well, the mayor does appoint everybody and the planning commission also does. No. But some other city official has some... Well, the city uh, planning commission, the mayor has appointments, yeah. the borough presidents have appointments, right. so it's, it's more it spread work. out. And that's, yeah. But that I would, mean, as it is now, the, the landmarks commissioners are all beholden to the mayor for their appointments, right. and most of them are operating on expired terms, which means that they're really vulnerable if they make the Why wrong decision. Why do you decision. think this mayor is not more responsive to your community? I think that it's a not a priority for him. I don't think that he realizes the the depth of concern that there is. Um, I also think that he believes preservation is an obstacle to development, which is has been demonstrated time and time again that preservation and development are really two sides of the same coin. I mean, they really are important, both important to the city. I mean, the, New York City wouldn't be New York City without its historic buildings. And yes. you'd hate to think that we'll, we'll look back at this administration or the next administration and say, what happened to New York's buildings during that time? We, we did such, you know, we, we did such a good job of getting this good law in place and then we just let, let it, it go. go. So what are some examples where development and preservation have worked together successfully? Well, I think 72nd Street on the west side right. is a great example. I mean, you worked on that right. and, and working with business owners, property owners, teaching them about the landmarks law, what you can do, what you can't do, how do you use the, the sure. sort of constraints creatively to create something that's better than if there were no regulations it's at all. It's kind of conventional wisdom where the people say, if your building is landmark, it's nothing but trouble, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's nothing but trouble if you if you don't have a responsive <laughs> landmarks commission. Right. But if you've got a landmarks commission a commission that's funded the way it needs to be funded, that has the staff and the expertise that it needs, that has the leadership that it needs, then there's no reason that that landmark designation can't be an opportunity to develop the city in ways that will be you know wonderful for future generations. One of the areas that's always fascinated me is the. Are, is the property owned by churches and religious institutions? Because, I mean, as they have dwindling congregations and less and less money, they mm -hmm. look to developing their site. And that's always been a problem, right? It's a huge challenge, and it's always been that way. And it's sad when you see congregations that have survived for generations, and suddenly they're faced with the, de the decision, do we develop, do we not develop? And uh, we see it on several sites on the Upper West Side so right now. Now, there are all ways, that there are development things, they can sell air rights or they can acquire, or people can acquire air rights. Or well, there's, there, um, with 
West Park Presbyterian Church, for example, Which on is 86th Street and Amsterdam, Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, there was uh, talk about redeveloping the site. Neighbors were very concerned, um, offered to buy air rights from the church to relieve some of the pressure, mm -hmm. give them something to work mm -hmm. with. It's a model that maybe could be used on other sites. I don't know if it'll work in this case. Um, it, it doesn't look so good. Um, at, at the end of the day, how does that compete with what a developer is willing to walk in and say, for this corner site on Broadway or Amsterdam Avenue, we'd yeah. be willing to pay X. There are, there are organizations that do provide some funding for restoration or, or there should repairs. Be, there should be more. I mean, there should be. There should be some public funds available if, in fact, it's a public it's to the a public benefit, which is what we say it is if right. it's a landmark. Right. What other, where, where is there high development? Where was there luxury development and the preservation of a landmark? Can you think of something? Luxury development and preservation of a landmark. What about Hunter? The, the, the Hunter? Towers Nursing Home on right. uh, uh, 106th yeah. Street and Central Park West, that was a it's site. A luxury condominium They or took the, the landmark, they restored it on the outside, basically gutted it on the inside and made you know luxury condominiums with a high rise in the back. There are pros and cons to that kind of model, yeah. but at the end of the day we've got the building which had been basically right. and, abandoned. And what about where they save a facade? That's, How does that satisfy preservation? That's more difficult. It, it's not to say that it can't be done well, but um, to preserve the facade of a building and develop behind it, it sort of it creates you know, yeah. the building becomes just that. It yeah, becomes a, a facade. facade. And uh, it's, there are not too many successful examples of that. So is a place like Chinatown a historic district or a landmark district? Chinatown, uh, I don't believe, landmarked is, is not landmarked, but it, it does have status on the National Register of Historic Places, which is getting back to the federal regulations. Right. And, and it's, more of a, um, it's more of a kind of a celebratory designation. But, but there's so much development, for instance, in, in um, Tribeca or in, uh, you know, around Little Italy area. What happens there? Are there protections in line for that? There, Again, if you felt that, that the Landmarks Commission was more effective. Operating the way it should be. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, there are a lot of the, the neighborhoods that you think of as being yeah. the most vibrant, the most successful neighborhoods in the city are historic districts. And it's been shown again and again that um, landmark designation improves property values, it uh, creates jobs and, and revenues from rehabilitation work, which is often more, more profitable, more lucrative for the city than just new construction. So there are all of these. And then think of the tourism. I mean, right. people who come to New oh, York City to go to Soho or Tribeca or the Upper West Side, um, it's really, this administration, future administrations, um, people in general really need to pay more attention to what landmarks do for our city and to, to think more in terms of measuring that and not see it as something that is an obstacle but really an opportunity and, and really recognize landmarks for all that they do for our it city. It sounds like it's part of the arts community, but it's never really been considered part of the arts community. You know, and the arts industry has always done an economic impact statement or something right, as right. to the impact. So how did you get to be a preservationist? Me personally? Yes. Um, well, I think it was something that I was always attracted to. I can, you know, thinking of being a teenager and Where going, did you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey. Uh -huh. And uh, my parents were both in education and we traveled all over the country and came to the city a lot and always historic sites were on our the itinerary. Stuff like exactly. That is fun. Broadway, yeah. you know, yeah. it and, That's great. and so I, I I was intrigued by the idea of place of of cities of New York in particular and so I decided pretty early on that that I wanted to do something that tried to perpetuate That's that. So great. And there are studies, I mean there are programs in I did a program at Columbia University uh -huh. which which has the first historic preservation program That's that was right. created there now many across the country. I, this I we haven't talked about this and we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. You Landmark West has done a book for children. That is And that's a great program. If there if I could 
say that there's a highlight to every day, it's something to do with our education yeah. program. It's, um, it's a, a booklet that we've done. It's a centerpiece of an education program where we go into public schools, private schools. We work with children. We try to teach them about landmarks, um, neighborhood history, why it's so important to be active and engaged in your community and okay. hoping that in a few more generations we'll have, a, we'll have a population of New Yorkers who really now, care about these issues. Now, you have a issues. website, Landmark West? We do. It's landmarkwest.org. It? Uh, it's Landmark, not Landmark. Exactly. Does it have the exclamation point? It does point? not have the exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> Landmark West has an exclamation point we should explain. To right. The well, folks. you're supposed to raise your eyebrows. Right. Raise. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but that program is, is stupendous, and I love the book where you really tell children what to look at on a building. Well, and kids love it. I mean, and yeah. it's so heartwarming, really, to be, we do walking tours where we're showing kids that's a cornice, and that's a stoop, and that's a, a you know, that is whatever it is. And it's it's really exciting to kind of see their eyes light yeah. up and, and see that they're learning to look at their neighborhood, yeah. and which is something that so many adults don't know how to right. do. And so that's it's always a shame. We're we're working from two year olds to ninety two year olds. We're we're trying I to. I hope you go higher than that. <laughs> Is there a, a a citywide organization that all the different groups belong to? Um, the the citywide organization that is really sort of the. Um, I'd say the most grassroots is the Historic Districts Council, and they um, work with groups like Landmark West and uh, groups in Brooklyn and Staten Island, all over the city. So how do you guys get together to do your political lobbying? And, and well, I think that um, it happens a lot of emails, a lot of uh, communications, a lot of, you know, yeah. the, you know shining the, the red alert. Yeah. Um, we're always... There's a there's a big network of of preservation groups and just people you know so, working on their blocks independently so individuals great. yeah so we're we're asking people to look around them appreciate what they see and if they see a building they want a landmark to contact the look for that application on the landmark commission's website and uh, thank goodness we have people like you <laughs> thank you and thank you very much for Thanks coming so on. Thanks so much, Ronnie. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.